Paul, Tertu, friends, colleagues. It's really a pleasure to be able to speak at this occasion. And uh, since the previous speakers focusing on the Anthropocene have um, provided us with some, well, heavy, um, um, heavy issues, uh, looking with some worry into the future, I thought maybe to end the day, I'll um, take a little bit of a lighter tack and uh, instead of into the future, look into the past. Um, so my lecture is entitled uh, 400 million 36 years of biomass burning. Um, and uh, well, with my other title, I almost give it away uh, from Calixalon to Crutzen. Um, well, Paul and I don't go back quite that far, uh, but uh, indeed, um, Biomass burning vegetation fires were uh, probably the first thing we talked about uh, one day in Paul's office at NCAR. And um, they've kept us uh, fascinated ever since. And um, so now I just want to step back a bit and say, okay, well, uh, biomass burning, what is it actually? Where does it come from? And um, what um, does it mean to us nowadays? So. Uh, from a biochemist's point of view, uh, biomass burning is, uh, well, should I say, the dragon's breath. Um, it's, um, it's respiration. It's the uh, reversal of photosynthesis, a process that uh, was discovered, uh, well, a few billion years ago by, by cyanobacteria, um, who managed to turn um, carbon dioxide and water by uh, photosynthesis into biomass and, and oxygen, leading to a slow buildup of oxygen in the atmosphere. And well, um, what goes up must come down. The biomass uh, in some way must be turned back into um, carbon dioxide and water under the consumption of oxygen. That's the process we call respiration. And usually goes on um, in soils and in, in the vegetation itself, but it can be vastly accelerated by fire and well, Obviously, since the earliest life was uh, in an aquatic environment, it's fairly difficult to burn uh, phytoplankton swimming around the ocean. So uh, what had to happen? Well, life had to move on to land. Now, what's needed to have a fire? We all know that. Um, firstly, uh, oxygen, which has been around in the Earth's atmosphere, something like um, uh, two giga years ago, uh, but uh, Present levels and levels that can support the fire were only reached uh, sort of in the late Silurian about 400 some million years ago when they reached a, a very high level in the Carboniferous, uh, which we'll uh, see is important in a moment. Um, its uh, presence has been evidenced by uh, the existence of oxidized rocks and fusane, a, a fossilized charcoal. Well, what else do we need? Fuel, obviously, and then um, to get them together and uh, in make a fire, we need ignition, and ignition probably was possible uh, as long as the Earth had an atmosphere, lightning was there, and also, of course, volcanoes can light a fire. So, now, how about fuel? Well, life moved onto land in the Silurian, that's about uh, a little over 400 million years ago, and the first plants uh, were something that could hardly carry a fire, little sort of shrubby things a few centimeters high. Uh, think about things like um, mosses and so on, and, and little, little spindly shrubs. And so it took a while for the land biosphere to evolve to the point where actually there was enough stuff around to hold a fire. And uh, well, this is where our friend Calixalon comes in. Uh, Paleontologists discovered two kinds of, uh, of fossils in rocks from the Devonian period. Uh, one which uh, they identified sort of as leaves, they called not Archaeopteryx, that was sort of a bird, but Archaeopteris. And uh, then they found another fossil that was mostly visible like in thin sections and so on, and um, which they named Calixalon. Now, um, if uh, Christos Erephos were there, he would say, and it comes from the Greek, there is kalis, which is beautiful, and xylon, which is wood. Um, anyway, it's beautiful wood, and we see in this, um, 
uh, thin section of calyxalon here, actually the same thing as a wooden structure today. So those were trees uh, which were uh, big enough to provide fuel for early fire, and then uh, we see evidence in that uh, in the presence of fossil charcoal or fusane um, that is uh, found together with calyxalon deposits. Now, after that came the Carboniferous, and that was probably uh, the world's best biomass burning environment. It's a bit surprising because actually uh, we think of the Carboniferous as a period with lots of swamps and mires and so on, and uh, people first had a hard time accepting that uh, swamps could burn, but there's very strong evidence that they did, and in fact, uh, something like uh, four or five or so percent of coal beds consist of fossilized charcoal. So um, it's called also the, the Carboniferous Conflagration. So uh, lots of fires uh, happened in this period of time. And the world really evolved into one where fire became an integral part of the global terrestrial ecology. So 400 million years of evolution were spent evolving uh, on the Earth's continents, a biosphere in which fires uh, play an integral, a, a, a key role in shaping the way in ecosystems function. One can sort of organize this in the way I've done in this diagram. The things that describe fire are fire intensity, just how how does a fire burn? How hot does it get? Uh, fire frequency, how often does it burn? Something that changes uh, from uh, return intervals of say a year or two in like savannas and grasslands to hundreds of years in, uh, in boreal forest systems. The fire extent, is it just going to be a small patch that burns or is it going to be hundreds of, uh, of, of square kilometers as in some recent fires that we've seen? Um, the ecosystems are described by biomass amount, by the structure of ecosystems, uh, the water cycle, the environment that supports the ecosystem. And this interacts then with the determinants of fire, how much fuel accumulates. If fire return intervals are long, much fuel can accumulate, but of course only if there is enough growth, if there is enough water available for that biomass to grow. So in a desert, even hundreds of years won't produce enough fuel to sustain a fire. It depends on how flammable that fuel is. Some stuff burns easily, like pine trees. Others uh, burn much less readily, such as palms and things like that. Uh, ignition frequency, is this a place that gets a lot of lightning, or uh, is this a place where um, ignition events are rare? Patchiness, fire weather. Fire burns a lot better when it's warm and dry, as we all know, than when it's, uh, when it's cold and, and moist. Uh, so, and these things, fuel accumulation, then determines again fire intensity uh, and um, flammability determines, uh, has to do with fire frequency and so on. So this whole system of, uh, of these uh, things that you see really forms an intricate web of interactions that really define much of terrestrial uh, ecology in grasslands, forest systems, and so on. So fire is, um, is not a destroying event as it is sometimes seen, but it's really an integral part of most natural ecosystems, at least terrestrial ecosystems. It re-initializes, it sort of reboots an ecosystem by removal of standing biomass, gives it a new start, and that's a key event in forest ecosystems. Um, the fact that then Patches only burn, creates a patchy structure where we have old stands adjacent to recent burns where uh, things got reinitialized. Fire remineralizes the, the, the biomass, produces nutrients again, which again help a new uh, ecosystem to start up. Uh, it puts pressure on species. Uh, if fires are frequent, then fire tolerant species will, be, um, uh, will benefit. And so also fire interacts with, the, uh, with animals by being a kind of herbivore, uh, a kind of uh, grass and plant eater, which competes with uh, mammals, for instance, um, browsers, grazers, and uh, which keeps savannas open. So it also structures uh, large scale, the large scale environment. So, by the time, and now we sort of jumped from 400 million years ago to just like a couple of million years ago, uh, by the time we come to the lower Pleistocene, 
All continents had an established fire ecology with very diverse faunas, uh, lo lots of uh, large mega herbivores, and then uh, we had, for instance, at the example of, uh, of, of Eurasia, we had an, an, a large megafauna going from, say, water buffaloes and, and hippopotamus to um, woolly rhinos up in the north, um, these beautiful fellows here, and, uh, and mammoths. And then somebody came on the scene, um, a gentleman named Homo habilis, uh, which then sort of had descendants, uh, Homo erectus, and he invented something. He invented the spear, and that changed a lot of things because uh, whereas before it was rather difficult to tackle a large piece of, um, of megafauna, if you have a spear in your hand, you'll do a lot better. And um, so the scenery changed to something maybe like this, uh, where these folks here we're able to actually bring down elephants with spears, which is something that's much harder to do if you just have your bare hands. Um, and um, this, in, on one hand, um, reduced the large uh, megafauna, but on the other hand, uh, it also allowed a completely new ecosystem, which was different from the one that was before in equilibrium with that megafauna to develop. So, um, the the co combination of human activity and, uh, and climate variations led to the elimination of these mega herbivores in just about all of the continents except uh, Africa, where we can still find lots of lions and elephants in parts of Asia. Um, we had a regrowth of uh, closed forests, which uh, had been kept open before by these, uh, these large herbivores, uh, where fire frequency was reduced because large forests don't burn as well, but fires become more intense. And humans sort of counteracted this uh, by uh, actually using fire as a tool to, for the desirable objective to keep the landscape open again for hunting and, uh, and uh, early agricultural activities. And they learned to domesticate fire. So we have this gentleman here sitting uh, in front of his hut. He's just invented indoor air pollution recently. Um, by bringing the fire into his housing. He's actually now also um, taking his spear that he appears to be building there, and he's lear learned something else, that if he sticks the end of the spear into the fire and carbonizes it, it becomes a lot harder. So that was another key invention in tool making was actually the use of fire for hardening spears. And he uses fires for quite a number of things, um, as I mentioned before, to clear grasslands, clear savannas, so that uh, he could Hunt. He would not as easily step on snakes as uh, if the grass was tall, something that's still used in Africa around habitations. Uh, it turns out that lots of animals come in after a fire, which is handy if you'd like to hunt them. Um, you can cook uh, and uh, repel predators, so people at night in the African savanna like to sit by a fire because it tends to keep um, unwelcome visitors away. Um, one can produce ceramics, clear land for early agriculture. So uh, a huge number of uses that humans evolved with. And so now we come to, um, well, so the last chapter before the Anthropocene, the Holocene. And um, well, this is a busy slide. I'll try and guide you through this a little bit. We can now see how fire evolved through the Holocene in relationship to climate and human activity. Uh, the red line here is a proxy for fire. It's uh, a, um, an index of charcoal found in sedimentary deposits. And we're starting here um, just as we come out of the last ice age about uh, 12,000 years ago. And we see fire growing at the same time as we see these temperature records here, the Epica uh, ice core record, the grip ice core record, as we see temperatures rising out of the uh, last ice age into the Holocene. And we see that fire uh, becomes much more abundant, especially in the early Holocene, when people certainly uh, were not in a position to, um, 
uh, because of their low numbers indicated here by, by this uh, log scale of population, we're certainly not in a position to be responsible for that amount of an increase in fire incidence. So fire shows its response to, well, weather and climate, that's natural for it. The warmer it gets and occasionally the drier it gets, the easier things can burn. And also we, of course, have a much more developed, a much more lush continental biosphere as we come out of the Ice Age. We then go uh, through the um, uh, relatively warm period in the middle Holocene, fire continues to become more abundant. And this time, we actually see human population grow and we see uh, indices of, uh, of land use uh, of cultivated area. And there are two, this H and I, which are sort of based on slightly different premises about how much land a person uh, needs to, uh, to sustain themselves. Uh, we see these indices slowly grow up uh, at the same time as fire grows. But if we look closely at which continents uh, hum humans are most abundant and where we find these records, it's actually quite difficult to see any relationship between that slow growth of human habitation and the growth of fires. They also don't show uh, the sort of correlations you would expect, essentially up to the very last part here in the, in the last 200 years and so. And so, in the case of biomass burning, that indicates the beginning of the Anthropocene, the moment where a sharp rise in the incidence of fire happens through the last uh, couple of centuries, together with the fast rise of human population, the fast rise of land use, and that of another uh, human-influenced atmospheric compound, uh, carbon dioxide, and methane here. So surprisingly enough then, um, it's actually in the paleo record, what has been uh, tossed around as pre-Anthropocene, it's been surprisingly difficult actually to find a close connection between human activity and, um, and the incidence of biomass burning and vegetation fires. Now, sometime in the middle Anthropocene actually, Another guy came onto the scene, which uh, joins our friend uh, here at the fire. Uh, he becomes interested in the stuff burning. He has his nose in the smoke, so he smells that there's all sorts of goodies coming out of the fire. And he decides to investigate what might be going on here and on a scientific basis. Uh, this is actually the beginning of uh, biomass burning research for atmospheric science. Uh, Paul's uh, expedition into the Amazon and Mato Grosso, uh, which happened, and this is where my 36 years come in of the 400 million. Uh, Paul going into, in the, in the years uh, 79, uh, 78, 79 into the Amazon, uh, taking the first samples of biomass smoke. Um, he actually decided there that termites were pretty cool too because they were emit methane. So um, these are the earliest uh, studies of, uh, of methane production from termites. And uh, Pat Zimmerman was kind enough to provide me with these samples, um, uh, with these uh, photographs. And the rest really is sort of history. Um, uh, Paul's paper, seminal paper in 1979 on biomass burning as a source of atmospheric gases, uh, the paper that really led the, the foundation uh, to all our research on biomass burning, followed by the key paper that was already mentioned today of, uh, of Wolfgang Seiler and Paul uh, estimating the um, global emissions from biomass burning and uh, well, finally, when Paul and I get together to write a paper, uh, it, was, uh, it was 1990 and we wrote the review, which uh, actually by now has something uh, like uh, almost 1,200 citations. So a very well-cited paper indeed. Now, um, you can see the global uh, publishing activity, the research activity reflected in these numbers here, uh, looking at uh, at 1979, that is in th indeed this one paper that I mentioned. This is where biomass burning really started. No uh, citations before that that have biomass burning in the title or abstract. Um, and then a few papers scattered through the 80s and then taking off in the 90s. Today, there's about 400 papers published every year that have biomass burning in the title or abstract. Uh, they're being cited something like, uh, uh, I think it's about 
14,000, uh, I covered this up here, about 14,000 times per year, so not bad. Um, and uh, well, here is actually, I discovered this, uh, here's where Paul and I uh, got together on this early research because um, uh, I had uh, on a cruise in the, um, in the Atlantic Ocean found that uh, my atmospheric aerosol filter samples in the middle of the Atlantic had turned black, which had puzzled me. And I talked to these gentlemen here, Carlos Buerres and Alistair Leslie, who were working at Florida State at the time, and, uh, which is where I, was, uh, where I was a young assistant professor in those years. And uh, they brought me the message of biomass burning. And they said, well, maybe all this black stuff in the middle of the Atlantic has to do with biomass burning. And uh, which is then what brought me to talk to Paul about that and kindled my interest in this topic. Um, well, they stayed in luxury hotels. Um, Pat Zimmerman has a nice story about huge roaches um, uh, swimming in the, in the sink there and, uh, and rats trying to gnaw their way through the bottom. So uh, Amazon research in the 80s was still quite different from what it's now. Tony Delaney, another partner, is standing in front of uh, one of these fires. And uh, well, sometimes the fires got a little bit too much for these guys, it seems. And uh, they were running away. Here is uh, Run Pat, Run. Uh, Patrick Zimmerman running from the fire.